flavor of what happened. So there are three questions that we're, um, we're interested in. Obviously, the most basic one, which everybody asks, because um, I have been, uh, uh, some of the designs that I'm going to show here have been my own designs. So when I say I build a children's computer using small talk, then people always ask me, why do you do that? So why should we build the uh, small talk computers at all? A, a lot of people see, think that it's a really stupid idea, so you have to explain why. And the, the main talk is historical. Who built these computers in the past and what some of the details of what they did, right? And uh, an another question, which I said that the talk is about computers past and future, since I'm still working on them, I hope that someday you'll be able to have a small talk computer. You don't have it yet. so. When will that happen? So uh, why depends on the, I am dividing the small talk computers into two different kinds. So uh, one is what I call the conventional computer, which is a computer that uses components you can buy anywhere. So you look at the computer and you don't see anything small talk about it except that I'm telling you it's a small talk computer. And then there's the specific computers where I can show you a little block on the design and say, oh, this block is to accelerate this part of small talk. So the why is very different from, for both kinds. Uh, for conventional computers, uh, sometimes in the past, you had some software that you wanted to give to someone, and they didn't have a computer that could run it, and they couldn't really even buy a computer that could run it. So you'd build them a computer, you'd put your software inside. For example, word processors were like that. You'd buy a machine that was a word processor, or you'd buy a machine that was a CAD workstation. Or uh, the Raspberry Pi is, is actually an example. They wanted to, they, they wanted to give um, children a computer that they'd connect to their TV, they turn it on, and they have a prompt for the P Python language. That's why it's Raspberry Pi, even though they spell it uh, Pi differently. And uh, the problem was that, you know, you could do that with a PC, but first of all, it takes many steps after you get a PC before you finally get to the prompt. Uh, so they wanted that to be built in, and they wanted it to cost at most, most $35 so that if the so children played around with it and soldered the wire and damaged it, it wouldn't be a big disaster. So uh, normally, these days, the, if the person has a computer that, I mean, look at all the laptops here that are more than good enough to run Faro or, or Visual uh, Smalltalk or whatever. So in, in theory, that's not a motivation today but it, it was in the past. And there's what I call specific computers. There uh, have been specific computers for many different programming languages, for Algol computers, Burroughs 5000. Uh, there have been lots of Java processors since Java has become popular. Uh, for small talk, that's the machines I'm going to talk about, Lisp machines. In fact, many people, when they first hear about my project, they say, oh, you probably don't know this, but in the past, there are people that built machines especially for Lisp. It was a failure. So you're, what you're doing is silly. And, uh, force is a language that's very popular to design special hardware for. So uh, we're going to focus on the small talk computers. So uh, what you have to keep in mind about a von Neumann computer, which is the kind of computers that we use today, uh, its great advantage is that it could use completely different technologies for the processor part and the memory part. So you could have mercury delay lines for the memory and uh, valves or tubes for the processor. Or it could have transistors for the processor and, and magnetic core memories or whatever. Or, or these days, uh, uh, the chips, the processors are made in a completely different factory from the DRAM, which uses tiny little capacitors. So that's the advantage of the von Neumann architecture. The problem is that 
uh, the, you, as, no matter how many gigabytes you have, you're only going to change one word at a time through this little bus. So imagine that your bus can transfer four megabytes per second. It's this really old, slow computer, right? So without knowing anything about that processor, if, if the program that I want is going to touch 40 megabytes, then it's going to run in 10 seconds. And that's what the Acorn people did through a lot of experiences. And that was the motivation for the ARM, the Acorn Risk Machine, that's now Advanced Risk Machine. Because they tested lots of different processors, and, and they saw that, um, well, unless they were really bad processors like the early 8080 uh, or the 6800, then sometimes they, they would uh, have lots of idle cycles between accessing uh, memory. But uh, by the time you got to the Z80-6502, they'd access memory all the time. So the memory access was the limitation. So if instead of, of this, I gave you a different processor in memory system that will access you uh, at 8 megabytes per second, then the same program is five seconds. This machine is twice as fast without knowing any detail. Now, of course, uh, the processors have advanced. Memory have advanced. So these days, you have uh, several levels of cache memory, right? So what the cache memory does is uh, not all accesses from the processor end up in the memory. So there are two ways of seeing this. So in this picture, I'm illustrating the case where uh, the processor sees a, a, a faster memory. So the, I have a cache that hits 95% of the time. That means that 95% of the times that the processor asks for some data, the cache supplies not the main memory. And it's four times faster than the memory. So if, if the, uh, if the uh, main memory can, only, can supply four megabytes per second, the cache can a supply 16 megabytes per second. But since it doesn't supply everything itself, sometimes it needs uh, help from the main memory, then on average it does 14 megabytes per second. Uh, you can also see this the other way. If you imagine the cache inside the processor like it normally is in today's chips, you can imagine that the processor, instead of uh, accessing 40 megabytes in total memory, it, it, it uh, access like uh, five percent of that main memory. Now, this number, ninety-five percent, depends entirely on the application. If the processor does random access to memory, this number will fall close to zero, and the cache won't help at all. So you have to know the uh, memory access patterns uh, in order to optimize this, or, or this technology doesn't work at all. So what's the memory access patterns for Smalltalk? And uh, so uh, when I first studied Smalltalk, so I'd look at the method, and what does it do? It sends a bunch of messages, right? So that's cool. So I look at the implementers for these various messages. So here's the implementer. What does it do? It sends a bunch of other messages. And I kept looking. And I'd have all these methods sending messages to each other, and I'd be very frustrated. <laughs> when does this program actually ever do anything? <laughs> and then I'd trace it, and eventually I found out that there were a, a bunch of uh, primitives that I'm going to show you in yellow. And the primitives don't call anything at all. They, they do their job. They add two integers or, or allocate an object or something like that, and then they give you a result. So uh, what's interesting is uh, uh, each of these parts in squeak, in, in derived small talks, we have a little expression that we always like to run zero or any integer. You send it tiny benchmarks. And it will run two different programs. One of them is the sieve program. And it will give you, uh, calculate the performance of your small talk in byte codes per second. And what's interesting is that it's almost entirely primitives. In, in fact, it's done like that on purpose. So very little of the blue part. It's almost entirely yellow. And, and the second is, uh, now I forgot which one, Ackerman? 
a very recursive algorithm that will give you cents per second. And essentially, uh, primitives have no part in that benchmark. It's basically all high level. So what's interesting is uh, the yellow part is more or less what you'd get in C. So if I'm not writing in small talk, I'm writing in C, I get the yellow part. So by eliminating the blue part, it's why C is much faster than small talk. So you'd think, oh, let's do that. Let's eliminate that blue part there and just write the yellow part, right? Uh, now, that's sort of like uh, looking at a company and saying, oh, the, per the people that actually make the company work are the people that cut the papers, the people that stamp stuff. All those managers, they don't do anything. The president doesn't do anything at all, so let's get rid of all of them. And uh, that's good in theory, but the human mind can't work like that. So if, if, we, if we do try to write everything in C, we won't get very far. So almost all progress that we've had in the history of computing is by first somebody doing something in small talk, which we humans can do, and then after somebody uh, did windows and menus and mice and stuff, then somebody comes along and rewrites it in C. And then says, oh, these stupid guys, why did they do this in slow small talk when they could have done it in C in the first place? Except I've never seen anybody do it in C in the first place. They always a copy after we, we've done the refactoring browser, after we've done the unit test, after we've done this and this and this in small talk, then somebody comes along and does that. But uh, the purpose of building a small talk computer is so that we, we just run the small talk initially, don't have to have the, the C people do it along. So uh, Alan Kay, obviously, was his um, graduate work. He worked with an uh, engineer, Ed Shido, I think it's pronounced his name. And they built a little hardware called uh, the Flex Machine. So it was going to be a personal computer with a light pin that you, uh, and a graphical user interface in the Flex programming system. But while he was working on that, he visited Seymour Popper. Here's, he's showing a mechanical uh, turtle. And he was working with the children. And Alan Kay was delighted by that. And he thought, well, children won't want this huge desktop that, you know, that we were trying to do for secretaries or for engineers. Children will want to sit in the grass with a, 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 a Dynabook. So that's the drawing he did in 1968. So he sort of gave up on his hardware. But the Dynabook, uh, he likes to emphasize it. It, it. it had hardware, but it was actually a service. So it, it could be a tablet like that, or it could be uh, virtual glasses like uh, Ivan Sutherland uh, was doing. And uh, I listed in the early history of small talk, you can see some influences on the software side that uh, led to the creation of Smalltalk 72. So uh, Smalltalk 72 was just a paper design that uh, Alan Kay uh, was working on. And then Dan Engels took that and actually implemented it in BASIC on a, a mini computer from the Nova mini computer from Data General. And then he rewrote it in assembly language. So now they had a working small talk. So uh, initially, they were exploring all kinds of different directions, visual programming, a pattern matching, like in Prolog or whatever. But once they had this code actually working, it, it trumped wild ideas. So uh, what happened was uh, Butler Lampson, Chuck Thacker, and some other guys from Xerox, they had just built uh, a computer that was completely different but could run code from the PDP-10 because uh, they, they wanted to be part of the artificial intelligence community, which all use PDP-10s. But unfortunately, Xerox had just bought a, a different company. So they said, no, you have to use this company's computer. So they said, no, let's not do that. They built a Mac-C computer that could run the code from the PDP-10. So they said, uh, to Alan Kay, do you have money? He said, yeah, I can buy a few uh, more Nova mini computers. He said, no, no, no. Let's build our own computer. That's, uh, it looks like a mini bar inside the desk there. The, each of these little disks that are on top of the desk is uh, two and a half megabytes, something like that. 
the, the computer had 128 kilobytes, of which half is for the frame buffer, so it had high resolution screen. So it, it, it did everything that uh, Alan Kay's previous uh, prototypes did. And it, uh, it could emulate the Nova perfectly, so all of his Nova code could run. But it, eventually, this auto computer allowed them to explore new directions. So they came up with the bit uh graphics, which we still use for 2D graphics today. Uh, for Smalltalk 76, uh, uh, then Angles created the stack, uh, the bytecodes, the virtual machine that we're familiar with today. And, and this computer was flexible enough. It, it had a, a, a part of the memory was in ROM, which emulated the Nova, but there was a RAM in which you could change how it worked. So it was a very interesting research project. Now, there's a slide that I'm not going to show here because it's completely not small talk computers. But to give a little talk, uh, context for my own uh, project, uh, in Brazil, a group of students, uh, graduate students, built a mini computer called the uh, Ugly Duckling, Patinho Feio. And what was significant about that is at that time, the general opinion was that Brazilians couldn't design computers. You could design computers if you were German or English or American or Japanese, but not Brazilian. So the fact that these, uh, it was a PDP-8 like with eight bits and four kilobytes of RAM, some like that. So it, it, it was built at the same time as this one and it uses a lot more components to do a lot less, but it's the very first uh, designed by a group of students. While well, these guys were really experienced, this was like their fourth design that they were, did together. So wouldn't be fair to compare. But that changed everything in Brazil that oh, suddenly, oh, let's build a company then to, to take this student project and make it into a commercial uh, design. But in 1977, uh, IBM decided to release, IBM had a factory in Brazil and it made mainframes and they decided to make many computers, the system slash 32, I think. And so they, they were scared, oh no, the, this Brazilian computer will never, uh, will, is a stillborn project. So they uh, created something that's called the reserved market policy. It, it evolved over time, but uh, at that time you couldn't import anything at all in Brazil. You couldn't import cars, chocolate, nothing, not even computers, uh, unless, you know, in very special cases. But what the reserved market said was that foreign uh, companies couldn't uh, build and sell computers in Brazil. So uh, IBM was not able to launch their many computers. They s stuck with mainframes. Uh, around this same time, uh, they, uh, the Smalltalk group was very frustrated that Smalltalk only existed you know, within Xerox. So they wanted it to be everywhere. So they built this machine. It looked like a big sewing machine. So you put the keyboard in front, and then you can carry a board. LNK actually used this in an airplane. And it has the mouse, it has the graphical user interface. This, it ran an updated version of Smalltalk called Smalltalk 78 that was developed specially for it. It had three different, or four depending on your options, uh, 8086 processors. So there was one for the graphics, one for the bytecode interpreter, one for the network, and one for the other I.O. So uh, this influenced a lot the evolution of Smalltalk. Then basically, Smalltalk 80 is a cleaned up version of the Smalltalk that happened. They built about five of these machines, and then an executive from New Jersey came to California to tell them, no, Xerox does not want to be, have microcomputers. So it died. If you, if you notice, this is a much improved of version of what the IBM that came out in 1981. So this is what we missed. But in 79, they, they, uh, built, they had built already several successors to the auto. This is the most impressive one. It uses a technology called ECL. So it had a much higher clock speed and it had cache. It had, uh, there's a little box uh, towards the top that's called IFU that was uh, optimized to uh, fetch bytecodes and decode them. So this was way faster than everything that they had before. It was a huge box and really loud, so they put it in a different room, and then a cable would come to your office and have the keyboard and 
uh, mouse and screen on your room because you couldn't stand to be in the same room as this one. But for many, many years, this was the benchmark for small talk. This was the small talk machine. So if you, you try to implement small talk, let's say, on a Sun workstation, you say, oh, I get about 0 0.5 Dorados on, on this Sun workstation. So, so that's how we talked about small talk performance at that time. So they, they were very frustrated, uh, you know, about the note taker being killed. So they got permission to have partnerships with uh, s several companies. And the ones that they had was Apple, which put Smalltalk on its uh, prototype Lisa computer. Tektronix created its own prototype just for this project. Uh, HP and DEC put them on a VAX. So they had to, uh, Smalltalk was 16 bits at the time, so they had to do a 32-bit version for the VAX. And, and uh, DEC got permission to work with Berkeley. So Berkeley got into small talk uh, from DEC. And the idea was that these guys would get small talk for free. They'd have a team of at least two engineers working on this. So that, and they were going to debug the famous blue book. So the blue book was being written that described small talk and described how the virtual machine worked. And uh, in exchange for getting small talk for free, then they, they had to help. And uh, Apple didn't do much with its license, but uh, in the mid-90s, it still had that license, so they were able, uh, Alan Kay was then at Apple, and was then Engels and, stuff, and everybody, so they were able to uh, evolve Squeak out of that, and out of Squeak we have uh, Pharaoh, Quiz, and Newspeak, and stuff like that, so uh, that was, possible because of, of this project. Uh, so in 1981 was when I first heard of small talk. I read the, the famous Byte magazine from August 1981. And so I, I saw the little arrow in the cut and copy paste. And, and I said, oh, whoa, that's, that's how computers are going to be from now on. So, but um, uh, uh, the next issue, Byte Magazine, then this Edward Sherlin said, had a short, tiny article that said, oh, this company is coming out with a small talk computer, this company was, so there was a huge list of companies that were coming out with small talk computers, so I said, oh, I don't have to work on that. Uh, other people are doing it. Uh, in the next year, this uh, friend of mine, he said, oh, there, there's a group here that, called the uh, uh, Laboratorio de Sistemas Integráveis at uh, LSI, that they, they need help for a project. So would you want to work for, uh, with me on that? So I, I went to talk with these guys. And what happened was they had just finished a project called the Graphics Terminal TG1000. And the only machine that the laboratory had was a very old HP mini computer, so it wasn't up to the task. So they, they said, oh, can you guys go to Motorola and select from their catalog a bunch of these VersaBus modules and then install their VersaDOS on top of this? And then we'll connect it to our terminal and then we'll have CAD. But we can't pay you anything, so you're going to have to work for free. So I said to my friend, well, I have to get something out of this project. So why don't we do this? I'm going to design, uh, I'm going to, we're going to do this, and then I want permission to use their machine to design my own chips, which is something I don't know how to do currently. And what I want to do is I'm going to design a small talk computer out of TTLs. And then I'm going to sell it, and then everybody's going to copy it, because that's what people did in Brazil. They all, no matter, any time a computer came out anywhere in any country, they get copied. And I'll let them copy it. But then I'll make a chip. So then the second version, they'll have to buy my chip. So what do you think about that? So he said, yeah, okay, let's do that. So, but as the project went on, I saw that they, they kept sending us back to Motorola to get the newest catalog. And I said, you know, uh, Osvaldo, they don't have money. So we're going to be doing this for 20 years. 
So let's propose to them to design the boards, because, for example, the Versa module uh, with 64 kilobytes of RAM cost $3,000, and it had about $900 of components in it. So, so if we design our own, so we proposed that. We proposed the machine, and we didn't want Versa DOS. I, we tried to convince them that Unix, I thought that eventually Smalltalk would uh, dominate, but I thought there was would, going to be an intermediate phase where Unix was going to be popular. So I said, let's do Unix, and we took like three months to convince them. And we did convince them and said, okay, so now you believed that Unix is the next thing? Yes. Well, everybody does. So your Unix is not going to be any better than anybody else's Unix. So let's do a multiprocessor Unix. So we, we switched to VME, which is Versa modules with the European format. And we, we modified the bus a little bit so that you could have a bunch of, uh, uh, of processor boards. Each one had MMU in cache. Uh, the, the memory uh, was static because my boss there didn't believe I could design dynamic memory, so he gave it to somebody else to design. Um, I had a group of students that were designing the, the serial thing, so you could connect terminals and printers and stuff like that. And it's interesting that this machine didn't have any interrupts. Uh, all all I.O. was handled locally, and then it get put into a queue in memory, and at some point, then the, the processor would fetch stuff. So the only interrupts that the main processors had was the time slice timer. No other interrupts. And uh, the, the SCSI board, none of us designed. SCSI was only defined in 1985, although we knew that it was coming. So we didn't have the, enough details, so we left it for last. But by 1984, the money hadn't arrived yet. For, there was a government a financing agency that uh, was going to give us the money. The money hadn't arrived, so I, I dropped out of this project. But in the same year, another friend of mine said, oh, the, there's a guy that wants to do a children's computer. Can you do a children's computer for me? So I did. Uh, you, uh, the idea was to run Logo so in ROM, so you turn it on and it run Logo. So um, here's, except that I decided, you know, I like small talk, so I added object-oriented things. So uh, at the, the middle drawing, it shows how the classes were in this Logo. And then it had multi-threading so that you could have multiple turtles to implement games. Each turtle could have its own shape, whatever. Uh, there's something that I didn't implement. Uh, uh, the bottom drawing in red would be a modification so that instead of eight bits of memory, it'd have 10 bits for tags or stuff like that. So that would make it a specific so, uh, logo computer, in this case, not a small talk computer. But uh, the part that we did implement was just a, a, a conventional processor. But uh, at the same time, uh, David Patterson, uh, Patterson's uh, students, they had a, already designed two processors that they called RISC. So there was the RISC and then the RISC-2. And uh, they were optimized for C. And, and, but they, on the side, they were working on, on, on the small talk that they had gotten from DEC. And they had put it on the Sun workstation. And then they said, oh, can we outperform the Dorado by designing a chip. So uh, that's what they did. I'm going to show some technical details. So uh, at the top is the formats. So you could either have an integer if the top bit was 0, or if the top bit was 1, you had a 28-bit pointer plus a 3-bit generation thing. That, uh, so David Young had invented what we call generational garbage collection. So it could track when an object uh, uh, when a pointer to an old object was stored inside a new object in a trap and handled that. So the instruction set is pretty simple. That you can have just a, a table. And every, for example, the add instruction, all of them have the option of uh, uh, the little percentage character. That meant that it would check tags. So if you didn't have the percentage, it, it would uh, deal with them as 32-bit raw integers. And if you, if you had the percentage, then, and it had some fancy stuff in it, and most of it didn't work out very well. So the idea is to take small talk source and translate to this machine language. And one thing that they did, there was something called the uh, Justin, the dynamic compilation, which we now call JIT, by uh, Deutsch and Schiffman. 
and they had something called the inline cache, so they adopted that. And uh, I'm actually going to talk about this tomorrow. So, and, and it had the, the uh, calls and returns were really fast because it had the, the overlapping register windows that were typical of RISC-1 and 2. And it had some fancy features. When you returned, you could uh, fill the new, the, the stack frame with nils because that's something that you have to do whenever you, you, uh, you send a message and you get a new math, uh, a new stack frame, all of the, the, the things have to be nil. They can't have red, random bits. But lots of the things that they did, they, they measured it. For example, the tagged instructions, the only one that makes a difference is tagged add. The other instructions, subtract, multiply, are so rare that whether you had the tagged version or not really didn't make a difference. So here's the, com the, the very first commercial. This is the very first time you could buy Smalltalk. And it was in the form of a Smalltalk computer, a conventional one. And so it was uh, Tektronix evolved it from their, their early prototype that it showed, right? So uh, they, they actually had a, a few generations of this follow-on. So now what's interesting here is that in order to get clients or uh, they, they, they use the term AI workstation. And it, it could run Lisp in addition to Smalltalk as well. Uh, and I think Unix was also an option. It didn't come with Unix. Smalltalk was its operating system, but then you could run Unix as an option. But you know, it's interesting that you, these days, you, you know, if you want to get money from funding, you just put AI on whatever your project you are, what you're doing, whether it has anything to do with AI or not. So things haven't changed so much since then. There's a very interesting uh, uh, chip done by the University of Tokyo. So they made it an integrated circuit. And in, uh, in Japanese, it's Katana 32. In, but since they published papers in English, they translated Sword 32. And it had several interesting features, but basically it would uh, execute as its machine language uh, by small talk bytecode. It had microcode. Uh, Caltech, uh, this guy, Bill Daly, Daly, I don't know how you pronounce his name. He shows up a lot in this story. So they had the Caltech object machine, and it had a, uh, some. It, Entering, interesting concept of uh, floating point pointers. So a pointer had some bits that defined, uh, let's say, segments and some bits, the offsets within the segment, and then how many bits, the top bits decided that. So it's kind of complicated. I've, I've used uh, similar schemes in some of my designs, except that the top bits are the, the class and the bottom bits are the instance within the class. And the instance zero is the class itself. <laughs> so it's good to know all of, the, all the, of these designs because then you can inspire. So I started actually, uh, since the money ran out, uh, the money hadn't arrived in 1984, I left and decided to do the small talk computer that I wanted to do in the first place. And there were three things about small talk that I didn't like. Uh, one, of it, one of it was it's in English. And I saw people struggling to program in BASIC in Brazil because they couldn't remember N-E-X-T. So, I mean, if you can't even remember next, how are you going to remember the full vocabulary? So I translated small talk to Portuguese. I took the blue book and translated it all into Portuguese. It's really hard to do. There are words like self, copy. They don't work very well. But I, I did translate it. and I. Uh, not at that time, a little later, I implemented it in Smalltalk V, uh, something called uh, multi-symbols. So you could have s several strings that you send uh, as symbol, and it'll map to the same symbol. And if you send print string to that multi-symbol, it, it, it looks uh, uh, a global selector. So you could actually uh, type your code in Spanish and then uh, list it on the browser in German if you wanted, as long as somebody bothered uh, there was no automation at all, so you have somebody manually put in all of the, 
uh, various languages. The other thing I, I thought that people wouldn't accept was that, uh, first of all, if you have a file server and then you have lots of small talk users, you have all these images. And you have the same objects over and over and over in disk. That didn't seem too healthy to me. And another thing is that people at that time uh, ran many uh, microcomputers by putting in a floppy disk with the application and running it. The idea that you'd, uh, people hardly had hard disks at the time, so the idea that you'd install it on your machine and then you'd be able to run. And in Smalltalk, you had to uh, file in the code. So if you, if you have a Smalltalk little program as a file out, you have to file in, you have to install it first. And I thought that people wouldn't accept that, right? I was very wrong about that. So I, I was uh, try, trying to come up with a, a, what we call a, a persistent object store, which is in fragments, so that you put in the floppy and the application would show up on your screen automatically. I haven't finished that because it's a very hard problem. If you look up persistent object stores and look up the papers, it's, it's not an easy problem. And the other thing that I didn't like was that the, the method objects were uh, black boxes. So they had uh, the literals, and then they had a bunch of bytes, which weren't objects. So I came up with a different execution model, which I cl call clone reduce, where, where uh, the, the methods were a, a bunch of uh, message templates, what we call an abstract syntax tree. And you executed that by cloning the abstract syntax tree, and now you have the runtime instead of the stack. And then the leaves of the objects only have, uh, they don't have other nodes underneath them, so they are messages that are sent. And if it's uh, more code, then you just clone that tree and put it underneath, and so on. But if, if it's a primitive, then uh, the, the, the message becomes an answer. So the tree shrinks as, as the, the leaves transform into their replies. So that's the reduce part. So the tree shrink, uh, grows and shrinks uh, dynamically in the n uh, level of parallelism. Well, you can have multiple trees, which would be the equivalent of multiple threads. But uh, within a single tree, as many leaves as you have at a particular time, depending on the shape of the tree, that's how many uh, things you could run in parallel. But then I, I, I froze that. I haven't worked on that uh, anymore and decided to implement the Blue Book uh, small talk. And at that time, uh, the digital talk came out with this methods that later became Smalltalk V. Methods was a text-only version. And it ran on a 512K PC. Not too many people had 512K PCs at that time, but it was a machine that you could buy. And then you didn't need a, uh, to buy a, a Smalltalk computer then. Right? So around that time, I built a small 68,000, sort of like a Macintosh, a black and white. Uh, half a megabyte of RAM, and uh, I actually, I didn't put small talk on it, I only put the bit blitz and uh, drawing program and stuff like that, so. Uh, at that time, I was, I needed money to, to, to build this, so I got a job at a company that made the first PC clone in Brazil. And then uh, I was, decided to leave to, because now I had money, I didn't have time. So, so, so I said, oh, I'm going to leave this. And then the owner of the company said, why are you leaving? I said, I'm building this small talk computer. He said, oh, let's do it together. So we set up a company that lasted into, from 1986 to 1988. Swamp from the University of Toronto is a very interesting machine. It was um, uh, built not from TTL, a bit slice, it's almost like TTL. And what it had interesting was uh, it used the top two bits to decide if it was an integer or a pointer. So if, the, if it's 0, 0, it's a positive uh, integer, and you don't have to do anything to convert it from tagged or untagged. That's a, already a valid 31-bit integer. And if it's 1, 1, it's a negative 31-bit integer. And it's the two other combinations. That's either a, con uh, a stack reference, a context object, or a normal object. And, and this is uh, interesting. That's why I like to work with hardware, because this is a, one, uh, uh, a trivial exclusive OR gate, two-bit exclusive OR gate. So it costs almost nothing in hardware. But try to do this in software. Do a, a software VM that uses this way of 
tagged integers. And, uh, here's another one uh, from Itachi. So it's a, a custom chip that also executes bytecode. So everybody wanted to have bytecodes. This is an interesting one because this was an audio company from the UK. And they decided to do, uh, well, they had their own language called Lingo, but it was also supposed to be a small talk uh, language. They had three, these three weird chips that they have the names for. And so it's a, it had 40 bits tagged uh, architecture. And it, it suffered a lot of criticism because, for example, in every memory access, it would check the length to see that if you're not accessing outside the object. And people said, oh, yeah, for, for at and at put, yes, you need to do that. But if you're accessing just an instance variable, then the compiler can check. So don't waste hardware on that. But uh, what if your compiler is broken or, or you know, security? I don't know. So now this is uh, the first thing I did with that uh, company. It was just a small improvement. It had one over the, the previous design. So this is a conventional computer. And like I said, uh, at that time uh, in Brazil, we didn't have the Macintosh. We only had the PC. So I had no uh, competition from graphical computers at all. Uh, uh, it was uh, energy efficient enough that uh, in this picture here, you can see a single Apple II power supply supplying two of my prototypes because <laughs> it used so little energy. And well, it didn't have that much money if you look at the other picture. Uh, in order to have a, a table for my office, I got an old door and shipping boxes and stuff like that. It, but it was color and it had the first Ethernet that was in Brazil, which was a problem because I had nowhere to connect it to. I didn't have a, a, a PC board for the, uh, the uh, 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 Ethernet for the PC. I was hoping to get one from 3Com because the clients had uh, contraband illegally imported thing. But in the end, I had to stop, set my project aside to design uh, Ethernet board for uh, the PC. And they gave me an 80, the 286, which has a 16-bit slot. And so I, I designed that. But while I was debugging it, they needed the 80 for another thing. So they took it back. And I no longer had uh, anywhere to connect it. So I got upset. And I, so I, I ripped out, uh, one, I had three of these prototypes. I ripped out uh, the Ethernet from one of them and put a 8-bit uh, PC slots on it. So now I could put PC boards. And I put a floppy disk controller and a hard disk controller. And uh, I got a programmer that worked for me. It was very interesting. In, in three years, we, we were able to write a C compiler, a text editor, a version control system two operating systems. And uh, we almost finished Smalltalk, and then the project got canceled by my partner. Here's an interesting uh, computer where several people that are part of this quick uh, community actually worked on. Uh, this is one of the founders of uh, Acorn. And he left uh, Acorn in 88. And created a company called Active Book. So that was going to be his Dynabook. It's kind of hard to see here, but it's a really big thing with a black and white thing in a pin. And, but it, it had uh, Smalltalk 80, a weird operating system. So uh, Tim Rollage uh, took Elliot Miranda's uh, Bruhaha Smalltalk, which was sort of force-like, and then he put it there. Uh, Bill Daly from Caltech, now he moved to MIT, and here they created the, the jelly bean machine or the J machine. So the idea is that processors would be as cheap as jelly beans. And uh, the picture on the right is uh, a machine with 1,024 processors connected to a Sun workstation. So just one of the boards uh, is shown here. So each little box is a, a different a processor, and then uh, between it and the other processor, there are three little black things standing up. That's the DRAM. And it has a connector, so that it's connected not only to its uh, neighbors on the same board, but when you sandwich two boards to together, it's connected to its neighbors on neighboring boards automatically. 
And what was interesting, uh, their small talk, called concurrent small talk, not to be confused with the Japanese concurrent small talk, which is completely different. Uh, their small talk actually used Lisp syntax, so, I mean, it's MIT, what can you expect, right? But they had something called active messages, which was very interesting. For you to send a message, there's a register. So if you write something to that register, it goes over the network. Obviously, the first word has to be a header, otherwise it's going to get lost in the network. So you, you write a header and then things. So the idea is that you don't create a message and store it in a buffer for somebody to pick it up later. No, you, as you're calculating the message, you inject it. And when it arrives at the other processor, it immediately finds uh, uh, the proper code inside that node to start executing it. So it, it reads from the register. So that's called active messages, and that's the lowest latency, latency or how you pronounce that. Uh, at the University of Manchester, a group of people uh, created the mushroom, which was a mix of TTLs and FPGAs. And it had a very interesting object memory. It had a 32-bit object reference in a 8-bit offset, so addresses were like 40 bits long. And their idea is that this is small talk, so if you need more than 256 fields, you just create an object that has a bunch of little objects. So you want an array with a million elements, build a little tree. Your, the rest of your code will never know. It's completely encapsulated, but he was able to to do the, most, the bulk of the garbage collection entirely in the cache without ever touching main memory. So when you allocated a new object, it only lived in cache, and only if it was a long-lived object, eventually it uh, get flushed to the cache, and then later flushed to the disk, because the virtual memory was integrated. So in 1990, I had gone back to work with LSI, uh, that, that lab at the university, and they got me a, a scientific initiation scholarship for me to design an object-oriented processor, whatever I want. So now I had learned to design integrated circuits. And one great thing that you can do in an integrated circuit that you can't do with off-the-shelf components is content addressable memory, CAM. And uh, uh, Ian Pio Marta has an interesting um, paper called, uh, oh, now I forgot the, the, it's something like object, uh, quantum mechanics or something. I, I, I have to look it up. But basically, he shows that every aspect of an object-oriented language like Smalltalk can be defined as a series of content associative memory lookups. And, but I had already figured that out, and I was trying to design the thing. And at that time, Self started publishing the first papers. And what was interesting was that they were able to uh, do message sends uh, in a negative number of talk cycles. And uh, that's how I'm, I'm going to explain that tomorrow, how you can do that. But I, I, I could, the best I could do was one clock cycle. So I said, ooh, I'm toast. So I dropped my project and designed a very uh, arm-like spark with a little, some extra features. But then uh, uh, as I was working on this in mid-91, my advisor that had been taking sabbatical came back and he killed it. Uh, here's another interesting small talk computer. It uses DigitTalk on top of DOS, and it had its moment in the sun. So uh, this guy killed the project, and then he had said, oh, you remember th that project that you never got the money? In 1987, the money arrived, and we bought a box of 68020 processors, and it's been sitting here. So can you do something with that? So I designed the machine which used the computers, I added one megabyte of RAM, and I added the, very, the cheapest transputer there was, a 16-bit T222, which allowed it to talk at 20 megabits per second to the, uh, the uh, neighbors. And so we built a machine. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it. Uh, and next Monday, I'm actually going to go to the lab, so maybe I'll be able to take some pictures. Uh, so we built it with 64 nodes, so it was a very obsolete processor, but I, I did a lot of, I started doing a lot of effort of having small talk run on 64 processors on that, but then I had some problems with that. So since I had just 
than a machine with really obsolete components. I, in 1988, I had started the Merlin Ford, successor to those machines I showed, with the ARM. So I had bought the ARM, I had bought all that stuff. We had actually written the simulator, assembler stuff, all in 1988, and it had been sitting. So I put together a little machine, but uh, I never ended up implementing small talk on it, but I, just a bit blitz from the blue book uh, with a drawing program there on the screen. And then at ECOOP 95, David Unger and his student Urs Hosel uh, implemented, they decided to review the small talk on the risk, the SOAR, uh, which is, has now been renamed RISC-3. Uh, and he found out that the output from his self-compiler looked a lot like C, not like C++. So he says, oh, we really don't need hardware for object-oriented programming language. We need good compilers. The, all the results we got for SOAR were because we had bad compilers. Now we have good compilers. We don't need that anymore. And I don't really agree with that. I think there's uh, uh, a limited exploration of all the possible spaces. But it was a very interesting result. And this discouraged a lot of research into our object-oriented design. Uh, the media pad uh, from interval research, unfortunately, almost all information about it. There used to be a lot of information, but almost all has vanished from the internet. This was a demo at Uppsala 97, where they took, uh, there's a, a chip. Remember what I said about that von Neumann thing? Well, here they tried to uh, make the DRAM in the processor into one single chip. And it hasn't become popular. That was the last time that has been tried, because, because uh, either you make the memory really bad or you make the processor bad. You have to choose one or the other. But it, it was a cool little chip, little risk with two megabytes of RAM, and they got squeak running on that. And they showed it off. And there used to be pictures. Can't find pictures anymore, sorry. So uh, when are we going to get computers? So in 1998, uh, I was working with the LSI in a, a digital cable thing with uh, NEC, NEC, Japanese company. And they were doing set-top boxes. And their set-top boxes were very fixed. So if you needed a different sound standard, they desolder a chip and then solder another chip. And I said, can't you make that programmable? So I, I, I proposed a processor called Tachyon to them. I said, will you finance, make the chip for me? And it obviously would be a very good small talk processor as well, but they didn't need to know that. So uh, it, it had what we call um, a move architecture. Every instruction is a move from one address to another one. And, and the end of the address might be an AOU, so that will cause an ad. Doesn't matter much. But they didn't like that, so I moved from Sao Paulo to Sao Carlos, and I opened up a company in 99 uh, to commercialize this. But I, I didn't have money to make the chip, so I used an FPGA. And this FPGA cost $600. And it was really tiny by today's standard. So I said, oh, OK, but if I put an LCD and I do a, a Dynabook-like thing, a, a tablet, then it's going to be reasonably uh, the cost won't be that bad. Here's another uh, squeak computer using a, a DSP. So by 2003, I was doing a, a project for another company called uh, the Truck Terminal. And I actually showed it up, showed it off at Oopsla 2003. I adapted the Truck Terminal to be a computer with keyboard and mouse and VGA, whatever. And I, I tried several different processors. Diet ST is, uh, uh, I was using the a fourth processor for my clients. And they said, why are you using that when you use Smalltalk? for your main project. I mean, it, it seems nicer, right? I said, yes, it is nicer, but I'm using an FPGA that's 20 times larger than the one that I'm putting for you. And they said, oh, can't you do it? So I came up with a way of, of, of fitting a small talk into just uh, 15,000 gates. And then they said, oh, don't bother anymore. We're going to use a larger FPGA. And then, so I killed that one. But uh, so uh, 
FPGAs had changed a bit, so they had a lot more internal RAM. So I decided it, uh, uh, the Tachyon was really hard to program. It, it executed four instructions in every clock cycle, and the compiler couldn't fit enough ins useful instructions in them. So uh, Plurion was just uh, lots of little stack machines, each with its own cache. That's way easier to program. Right? Then in 2004, uh, Dan Engels had suggested, oh, we're, we take this, we, squeak is written in slang, we translate it to C, and then compile it, why don't we translate it to Verilog? And then we'll have squeak in hardware. Well, uh, these days you actually, uh, back then it wasn't practical, these days you have what's called high level um, uh, synthesis, but it's, Really, you have to write in a different style. You can't write random C code and expect it to work. But even if you could, the FPGA necessary to program that would probably cost you something like uh, $5,000 or more. So I looked at that and said, well, actually, we can divide the, into the object memory, the interpreter, and the primitives. Now, if, if the interpreter, if the bytecode execution were in hardware, then why don't I just take the slang code for the primitives and for the object memory and run that? So I proposed the squeak processor, uh, which had a 24-bit microcode, actually 16-bit plus a constant. And uh, I proposed it to the squeak community, and nobody was interested. I mean, I didn't get a single bit of feedback, so I set it aside, and I worked on other things. But in 2008, uh, a group uh, from the Netherlands, the uh, United States, and so on, they, they said, oh, uh, can't you do a processor that would run Squeak? So I said, yeah, I have this 2004 processor. I could update it and improve it. So this is a version one of Silicon Squeak. Uh, and it had a 32-bit instruction. And most, the typical uh, squeak bytecodes translate into a single 32-bit instruction. So it's really fast, but if calls and sends then are slower. Uh, in 2011, uh, yeah, one, let, let me go back here. Uh, one interesting thing is that there, there's these three caches and there's these units, and, and they, uh, the, the processor seems to be a three address risk processor, which also does a branch on every instruction. But what seems to be registers really aren't registers. They're actually um, uh, addresses in memory that the cache handles uh, specially. So uh, you could get up to five cache misses on every instruction, and that was really hard to, to, to deal with. So uh, I simplified it here so that you, you only could get one cache miss. And what I did, I added a coprocessor to this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it uh, here. So this, uh, so uh, besides the AOU, you had this uh, 64 AOUs each eight bits wide. So the idea is that uh, when you have com the compiler, adapting compiler, the compiled code could use this. So the rest of the code didn't have to be that fast. So I had a 16-bit thing that could only manipulate one thing at a time, so only one cache miss could happen. And uh, uh, So the idea is that the, the first you'd have the interpreter that would use the 16-bit microcode. Then you'd have a very simple compiler that would generate the 16-bit microcode. And then you'd have a fancy compiler that would address this AO matrix for the, the yellow part. So this, this is what would, uh, so the other part is to run the blue code, and this is to run the yellow code, okay? Here, uh, I took that a little one step further, and the idea is that uh, at runtime, since it was an FPGA, I could switch 
how many process you could either have lots of simple silicon squeaks or a few silicon squeaks each one with the, the coprocessor so depending on whether you're running more blue code or yellow code your FPGA would switch so that, that was uh, I was working with a laboratory for reconfigurable computing at the university and that's something that made them happy uh, in 2017, I worked on an alternative to FPGAs, which I call morphologic, where e uh, you just have a huge matrix. Each cell can be one of these eight values. And here's an example of an adder. An adder is actually something that this is really bad at compared to FPGA, but there are the kinds of circuits that this does a good job. So this looks like RAM. So you write to this RAM, wham, you have this uh, asynchronous circuit that you give data and it spits data back. And in 2018, since the risk 5 uh, so, so like I said, they, there was the risk one and two, they renamed small talk on the risk to be risk 3 The follow one was called SPUR, which was a Lisp machine for multi multiprocessors. Now it's risk 4 So the current one is called risk 5 a really simple thing. And it has, a, 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 this is a really bad drawing I found on the internet, which has a base instruction set, which can be either 32i, which means 32 bits, 64-bit integer. So it, it has about 30 instructions. Or uh, 64i or 128i. And there's now a 32e for embedded system, which has half the registers. And besides these, you can have a bunch of extensions. For example, the m extension will give you multiply divide the basic instructions don't have a gives you atomic instructions f 32 bit floating point d 64 bit floating point q 128 bit floating point v vector instructions and uh, c compressed instructions that are only 16 bits wide and then there's also the supervisor level and so th this is still being worked on uh, one of the Things that are interesting are is the J extension for uh, Java, JavaScript, and Smalltalk and Lisp, right? So I, I had come up with the idea of taking four features from uh, Silicon Squeak and just adding it to Risk Five because you can create your own extensions. These are just a standard extension. You can create your own extensions. And that, since a lot of people are interested, that would make people interested in that. And uh, the, the J extension is still being worked on. So if, if any of you have ideas and want to help. Uh, right now, it's preliminary. So uh, I, I tried to follow Alan Kay's uh, recipe for research, where uh, you start from where you are now. You imagine the world 30 years from now. And what would be silly not to have in that world? So for him, it would be silly not to have uh, the Dynabook. And for me, it'd be silly not to have atomic precision 3D printing powered by solar cells and using carbon drawn from the atmosphere or whatever. If, if you have that, you can have uh, any object you want for free, even if you have 10 billion people and most of them don't have jobs. They still can live r really good quality lives with all the objects they want. And if you want to print, if you want to have a wrench to unscrew this, you can print a, a pure diamond wrench if you want. But why not print one which has uh, enough computing power in, in, the, in the handle, the equivalent of today's data centers, where it could vibrate stuff and look inside the, the head of the thing you're trying to unscrew. So I imagine an infosphere, as Alvin Toffler said, not the IBM product, where all objects, your clothes, your shoes, everything would have computers in them, really high-performance computers. How do you program these computers? So Alan Kay says, bring this back um, 15 years before. What does the intermediate thing look like? For example, Macintosh 2C, I. Or here I imagine that you uh, have the Internet of Things where you actually have grains. So you, you, you decide how many kilograms of computing you need, and you add, and they work together. So uh, 
how can you, spending extra money, have the 15-year thing today? Right? So the auto cost a fortune, but they built it. And we could use wafer scale, where you have a wafer which is a single chip. That simulates the chip from... Or you could have tons and tons of FPGAs connected together. So that's the way. So w when do we have it? 2050 is a good answer. I mean, if you can't wait, maybe with enough money, you could have it in 2020, right? So what I'm working now, this is the end, uh, I have a bunch of blocks, and you can have as many of each of these blocks that you want. They, they are the version 5 of Silicon Squeak. So there's the external flow processors. They are more or less equivalent of a cache in a traditional processor. There's the data flow processors. They are the equivalent of the AU matrix that it evolved. So Silicon Squeak and the AU matrix have merged together. And there's a the morphologic as well. And what an instruction looks like, uh, this is considered a single instruction. It uh, can have any number of bytes. And, and each block ends with control flow instructions. So uh, the color shows which part of the hardware is going to look at each of these instructions. And there's the setup instructions that will change how things are routed. And I can simulate uh, Silicon Squeak version 3 perfectly, uh, but the, twice as many bits for the instruction. So here's a, an example of that expression and the code fragment. Uh, we have something called frames that live between instructions. In, in, in the simplest case, this devolves into a stack machine. So it can be a stack machine or it can be a, a fancier thing. And, and things execute out of order. Whenever the frame is ready, then the instructions that use that frame. Uh, well, I think I passed my time, but I can answer questions. If So I just wanted to give you the flavor of Questions, if there is anywhere. Yes. <laughs> sure. uh, you started uh, with, um, with uh, the original small talk computers and small talk systems, mm -hmm. and then you moved on to alternative designs for small talk computer. And then you moved on to new designs for things that are not small talk anymore, OK? Uh, how do you envision the software part of those more advanced or complex architectures? Well, uh, yeah, the previous versions of Silicon Squeak were very small talk specific. For example, they even understood how the, the tags in Squeak work or something like that. Uh, but um, the last version is a little bit more generic. Uh, but the idea is that I, I've, I still can simulate all the old stuff. So I'm still working on Squeak. But uh, sort of that's why I, I made an analogy with the Auto. The Auto started out by simulating the, the Nova mini computer and running all their old stuff. And then once all their old stuff was available, then they started new stuff. So I think that. Uh, I have something that uh, is still Silicon Squeak. It can still do everything that the previous designs did. But now it's flexible and it can simulate uh, stuff that I want in the future, like the clone reduce small talk that I set aside in 84 and haven't worked on. I want to work on it again. But uh, uh, so I want a hardware that will allow me to, to do that. Oh, OK, uh, if I may insist a bit more on the same direction. Uh -huh. um, when, when you did your parallel with Alan Kay's res, um, for this research, uh, he sort of had a vision for the applications of the system that didn't exist yet. Not a detailed design, but, uh, but uh, an, a very good idea of the kind of applications sure. and, the, and the way that would enable people to do new things or to think in new ways. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the, the, the applications for, for your grain scale computing and, and your atomic computer vision for the next 
for 50 years? Well, I, I think that uh, computing in the future, you know, it's going to flow through all the devices that we have instead of being isolated. So I have my phone, it's separate from my laptop, it's separate from stuff. From So I, I think that uh, the tendency is to have, uh, I, I don't like the term cloud, the, the idea of the cloud, but um, uh, something fluid. So computing, it's a little bit more fluid. Uh, we've had attempts in the past. Uh, so, uh, for example, it was a company called Magic Cap that had a small talk inspired language called Telescript, which was sort of the opposite of what we have today. So, Telescript would uh, be a program that started on the client and then would go <coughs> to the servers, go around the servers, and then come back to the client with stuff. So, there are other computing things that we haven't explored, alternatives. I want to explore them. I don't know which one is going to work. I want to have a platform in which I can explore the stuff. Okay, thank you. Okay, one more. Yeah. Uh, not so much a question, but uh, to mention something that uh, happened recently, uh, and that is in relation to your slide where you say that in the 80s, uh, bridging the von uh, Neumann uh, um, <coughs> bottleneck uh, there, there was uh, uh, an attempt, and then since then, you had not seen an attempt to, to bridge the von Neumann uh, bottleneck in Smalltalk. Well, something uh, that happened uh, recently, and by recently, I mean a month ago, uh, I uh, accidentally bumped uh, into Elliot Moss, uh, mm. the guy who did uh, um, the design of the, of the first uh, stack mapped uh, activation discipline for small talk and uh, it turns out that he, uh, he is uh, working on on exactly that uh, I bumped into him on the gem 5 uh, mailing list and in gem 5 uh, they use that simulator to do architectural research for processors in memory right. where you have uh, on the same die you have the capacitors and the transistors <laughs> because it has been you know only a few years that now we have silicon technology that allows that uh, so the idea is that uh, the whole uh, architecture where you, where everything is about well how do we fit in the cache so the so that the, the hit rate is maximized uh, we don't need that anymore. So Elliot is now working on a garbage collector that uh, will take advantage of a cacheless memory architecture. So here's good news for you. There is actually a small talk work, the uh, small talk work, which right. is taking advantage of uh, von Neumann uh, bottleneckless uh, silicon. Uh, that is specific to small talk, and, and this is the, 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 the GC for small talk object memory. Sure, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Jesso.